this presentation, we're going to be talking about uh, various cardio, cardio CSS treatments that we've been using in recent maps. Um, our main theme around this presentation is maps with distinct personalities and um, pushing the limits of what is possible in the most aesthetically pleasing way. Um, the maps that we are showing today have all been made in map, map box data tiles in Tile Mill 2 and um, all work within the last six months. Um, Pinterest. Um, the main goals for this was to create uh, you know, something very playful, tactile, and like handcrafted. Um, we had to think about a lot of the design objectives going, making a map for a brand that already has an, a narrative in place. So, you know, thinking about how we can create a, a map that goes along with the existing brand narrative and how we can it, enhance the stories that users are creating through new map features. Um, now um, I'm just going to go through some images of the techniques that we had fun experimenting with. This is an image of Amsterdam and here you can see we've used um, multiple textures for the, for the design and uh, the water looks kind of like construction paper so really playing on that tactile playful look and feel for Pinterest. Um, uh, one thing that I, I like to use a lot, it, like a color trick that I think is great is um, like focusing on like three main colors and then tweaking them to like, you know, to just do like hex, like lighten or darken 5% to kind of create a very compact, harmonious uh, color palette. And uh, I just generally think this is a great design exercise, but in most cases for base maps. Um, <clears throat> Here we have a zoomed in view of some of the path, the footpaths and also the building footprints that we were experimenting with. And here you can also see like a lot of the, you can see the texture and how it really makes it bold and um, very handcrafted. <laughs> um, and here's another zoomed in view of Paris. And, and, and one of the most fun things working on this map was uh, using big custom labels and typography. And this just added a lot, a lot of character to the existing narrative on Pinterest. And I'm going to hand this over to Seth, who is going to talk about label hierarchy and clipping. Um, so for, I mean, for most maps, we want to have some form of hierarchy so that you can tell the relative importance of things. Uh, we also wanted to do it in a way where we could uh, incorporate some character. So uh, we've got uh, approximately a four element label hierarchy. So, uh, and we use both color, textville, and size uh, to demonstrate different uh, relative importances. So uh, the San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley labels are all red and they've got kind of a, a sketchy fill to them. Uh, and then the, the other less important cities, or depending where you're from, more important, but smaller, uh, economically less important, I don't know, anyway. Uh, so in some cases, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we use the sketch font there, and then things get smaller, and we just tweak around with the, uh, the, the fonts a little bit. Um, so the other, the other thing is that... Um, one of the things that we end up doing at Stamen a lot, and a lot of this is Eric Rodenbeck's influence, he likes really large type. And if you show him something, he says, can you make it bigger? Um, and this actually ends up being really problematic uh, when you're making maps because, well, when you're making tiled web maps uh, because you end up with porters. So in this case, uh, we have the wonderful uh, brotherly love city of Ladelphia. Um, and those problems crop up all over and you have to just find different techniques for either minimizing them or tweaking the font sizes so that you'll prevent that from happening as much as possible. Um, so there are a couple of approaches you can take to this. Uh, the first, and when I was going back through this project a couple of weeks ago, um, I realized that we weren't taking advantage of this. So what you can do is you can add a buffer around each individual tile. So uh, tiles are typically 256 by 256 pixels. Uh, so what you can do is you can say I've got a 128 pixel buffer around each of the edges. So you're rendering a much larger tile that, over, uh, that overlaps with adjacent tiles. And then when you draw a label, it 
blur it bleeds onto the next one, but the next one has the same data and bleeds onto the previous one. So you end up with labels that cross boundaries. Uh, that works fairly well. Um, however, so a lot of this is very Cardo CSS specific. So there are a couple of gotchas here. Um, if you set text min padding, which tells you how far a label should be from the edge of a tile. Uh, if you set it larger than zero, it ignores the buffer and it actually does it according to the edge of the tile, not the larger area. Uh, text avoid edges is the same problem. <laughs> so um, one thing you can do there, uh, depending on uh, how you're approaching it, with vector tiles, with vector data tiles, you can't do this, but uh, you can meta tile. Uh, meta tiling, uh, especially for labeling, has some nice performance benefits where uh, you draw the same 512 by 512 tile, but it's offset a little bit, and then you slice it into pieces. And you can actually do really, really, really large uh, meta tiles uh, and get some fairly seamless effects. But if you look really closely uh, in places that have really densely packed labels, you can see patterns where there's clearly an edge or things just go off at an angle and then on the adjacent meta tile they come off at a different angle. And yeah, so it's mostly about hiding the seams. Um, let's see, uh, text min padding and text avoid edges both work here because you can do this without buffering. Uh, if you buffer it, you can get some additional benefits, but then you're drawing an even bigger tile. Um, so the other thing that happens is that uh, clipping is inevitable, um, especially in Germany. Um, this is an area of Germany where lots of things end in Dorf. Um, and there are lots of hyphenated names and it just it gets really problematic. So um, what we did for this is we selected features that had lengths of 12 characters or longer and just said, don't show these. Um, yeah. So if you're an editor, you can go in and you can change the name and you can provide an alternate long name or something like that. I don't know. Um, so, uh, and to do this, uh, we use a feature within Mapnik and Cardo where you can do selections uh, against attributes. So this is the name attribute that's coming out of the source data. And you're, you're matching it to a regular expression, which is what the equals tilde is. And then the string within that, the caret matches the beginning of the string, the dollar sign matches the matches the end of the string, and then the dot matches any character, and then the 12 comma says match 12 or infinity of these things. Uh, and then we use what we've discovered to be uh, the equivalent of display none for text, which is just to set the text name to an empty string. And then it won't try and use uh, an expression to display it. And it looks a bit like this. Um, you can also thin things out a bit using text min distance, uh, which gives you the ability to uh, essentially create padding between tiles. Uh, however, again, with the really long names, uh, this doesn't work because the center point of a label on a particular tile, I mean, you can kind of see it here, but we've got them filtered out, uh, near Ombach and Kressenbach. Uh, the center point of Kressenbach is far enough to the east on that tile that if it were even longer, uh, it wouldn't be visible in the buffer on the tile next to it. So it, I'm getting a little bit in the weeds, but this is this is the kind of stuff we end up dealing with to get uh, to to really focus on these things. So you end up with clipping anyway. Um, so the the best approach we found here is that reducing the density of labels in the data layer. So uh, querying pretty aggressively uh, or finding ways to only get the things that are most important. Um, this is where the scale ranks that Natural Earth introduces at the lower zooms come in really handy, because uh, that way you don't have to display everything. You can only display the things that are really important. Um, Ed, you want to tackle? You want to jump in? We're going to talk about custom fonts. Okay, so uh, while we're on the subject of type, uh, we did a lot with custom fonts here, and this is what we ended up going with in the end. Uh, we wanted to go with a very crafty feel, with like very much, this is something that somebody could have actually drawn with a marker. Uh, and we, at one point, had actually done that down to the street level, which was pretty neat. Um, but custom fonts, I mean, this is something that is is pretty straightforward. Uh, and if you're using if you're using tile mill, there's a bunch.
bunch of fonts that are built in. They're ones that have open licenses. Uh, in this case, uh, Kate had licensed the, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, the font that, that shows Washington here. So we created a local directory in the project called fonts and then said, hey, Mapnik, look in the fonts directory for more fonts. Um, and in this case, um, we like Helvetica, it's Damon, so that's that's the example I used here. Because um, Helvetica is not one of the built-in fonts. It'll then look at it in there. So here's another here's another look at it. So I'm going to pass this over to Alan. Yeah, the, the Pinterest map is really the brainchild of Kate and Seth here, but um, I was involved on a lot of these mapping things as well. Um, I also wanted to show some of the the tweaking of the letting and kerning of the text, which was apparent in the in the Pinterest map, but it's very subtle. So here's an example of another map that we were working on where we really ramped that up a lot. Um, this was for another client that ended up not going in this direction, but we really liked the style. So really, uh, we just compressed the line spacing, compressed the character spacing, and added um, really heavy halo around the text to make this super thick, super bunched up um, uh, labels, which look really great. And so there's a little bit of that going on in the Pinterest, and there's a lot going on here. So you can really see it in, that, in the Central African Republic, where the letters are actually blending into each other, and the only reason you can really read them is because of that halo around the outside. Um, we also, especially on the Pinterest map, did a lot of uh, customizing the placement of individual labels. Um, so Pinterest was using the, the Mapbox um, vector data in Tomil 2, so we couldn't alter the data itself, but there's uh, a lot of things we could do with the data that was coming out of those tiles to modify how we were going to show them. So you'll notice uh, as, you, as you look more closely, California, the label is aligned at a big angle, um, Mississippi as well, and then even a little bit more closely if you look the label for Kansas is like squeezed into the edge of Kansas just on the zoom level just to get out of the way of that giant United States label. Um, and we can do that again just in the Cardo CSS. Now we didn't add any angles or orientations to the data but the data is coming through with the name so we can say if the name of the label is California adjust the orientation with negative 44 degrees to, to turn the angle so that it goes along the length of California. Um, these are the kind of customizations that, uh, that print cartographers are used to doing all the time, but it, when we're working with web maps, we tend to just let all the labels be automated. But if you really want that custom look, you can check out you know, every zoom level in your map of the United States and adjust the labels a little bit if you need them to, to uh, look like they've got that human touch, which they do. Another really subtle thing that you might not have noticed about the Pinterest labels, unless I uh, show you a graphic like this, is that we um, put a lot of them slightly off of you know, 90 degrees or zero degrees, depending on how you're measuring. Um, some of them are tilted a little bit to the left, a little bit right, and that's actually happening all over the map, um, and it's happening on an automated basis. And how did we do that? Again, we didn't introduce anything into the data, but coming through with those labels is the OSM ID, which this was an ingenious thing that um, Seth thought of, that we can use that as a kind of a random number in a sense to seed this little adjustment. So we take the, the text orientation, we take the OSM ID and do a mod three and then minus it by 1.5 degrees so that some of them are up to 1.5 degrees this way and some are the other way. Um, I forgot, what's the what's the OSM ID less than zero doing? Oh, um, so when data gets imported uh, into a rendering database uh, to create synthetic features, it end up in sudden, yeah. they end up getting negative OSM IDs because they don't correspond to actual features. So we, we're just accounting for that here. Hmm? It, it's from multi polygon. Okay, uh, so multi polygon relations. That, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And again, that's something that the way those are coming through is, um, I think, specific to the Mapbox vectors, or would that be with, maybe it would be with any OSM data? With OSM, yeah. Okay. And then just a few more slides of the, of the textures coming through. Um, maybe this is something that Kate or Seth would want to talk about, the, the fact that there's textures that you can see through the buildings and through the parks that we really used the blending modes that are available in Cardo CSS rather than applying a texture to 
a different texture to a park or a different texture to buildings, we can use the ba that background texture and have it keep coming through um, by basically, you know, the shading on the buildings is all, you know, multiplication or, or um, I'm not sure, yeah, usually multiplication, sometimes lighten. You can see that a lot in this park here. <laughs> Yeah, and here's an example of what that, that code looks like. So there's a, a green fill on the park, but the composite operation of multiply lets that background texture be applied to that green fill. And there's a lot of other kind of, we're using um, some soft light operations, we're using some blurs, we're using drop shadows, so there's a drop shadow around the edge of the, the water that you can just barely see on the screen, but it gives that a depth uh, that you wouldn't get otherwise. This is a trick that we learned from the Mapbox guys, thank you. So we, we really pulled out a lot of the stops on that Pinterest map using a lot of tricks, but here's another mapping example um, that is a recent project that we did uh, that um, also Eric showed in his talk last uh, yesterday morning. Um, this is for the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, which is a nonprofit that sort of administers a lot of the national parks in the Bay Area. And they wanted a, a customized map that really reflected their a parks style, a national parks um, kind of map that you would expect to get from a ranger when you go up to a national park. And it's like a real um, specific look to it that was really hard to get and took a lot of little tweaks to get to it. Um, so you can see a lot of the different special icons we've got going on there. This is actually in Tile Mill 1, so we were using uh, OpenStreetMap combined with a lot of the, the public domain parks data that they were providing. So those locations of trailheads and locations of campsites and the overlooks were all coming from uh, the park service themselves. And once you start to zoom in and those features get labeled, uh, you can see some of these, like there's some trailheads that don't have labels. There's uh, a visitor center that does have a label. A campground has a label. Some of those have a, a campsite icon. Other things like the YMCA is just a, a dot. So there's a lot of, um, of types that just, you know, historic balloon hanger. We didn't want to build an icon just for the one historic balloon hanger or whatever that would look like. So um, what, we, what we see here, and we're going to explain in the next few slides, is that we're using um, shields and markers sort of interchangeably to, to show a lot of these things. Um, so above that lake, above the label Fort Cronkite, you can see there's a whole bunch of, of dots, which are markers. But then there's some of those dots have labels, which are actually shields, which we're doing a, um, a bit of tweaking to to separate the label outside of uh, a normal, what you'd expect to say, like an interstate shield where a number or a label is inside it. Um, and we also had to do a bit of tweaking to get the alignment just right. We wanted to have the labels, so if you look at the campground or the visitor center up above the label Marin Headlands, um, you notice for the icons we have, the labels are left justified above the icon and to the left edge of the icon, which is actually relatively hard to do. Um, whenever we were trying to do those left to right justifications, it would always center, it would always align to the center point of the icon rather than to the left edge of the icon. So if you were actually to look at what those things are, those are double wide uh, icons that have a transparent half so that, and, and if you look at the label, um, the title of the slide, you align it to the midpoint of the icon, but because half of the icon is this transparent square that you don't actually see, it ends up feeling like it's aligned to the left edge of the icon. So almost all of those icons that you see on the map are actually these double width, half transparent um, symbols like this. Here's another, another uh, zoomed in example where you see more of those outlooks that have labels. And there's also something that Eric was really proud of, the, uh, 
you know, it's as we tell the story, that the amount of time we spent on those overlooks, you know, amplifies. So yeah, we spent weeks getting all those angles just right, so that you could tell which direction you're looking from uh, each of those uh, overlooks. Um, and at first, we thought we can do that with. Um, a lot of those uh, SVG transformations or rotating the image based on some value because here we were actually in control of the data coming into the map. So we could say, we're gonna say this, this overlook has an orientation of 315 degrees. Then we could rotate the icon to make that work. But again, that was actually not possible now that we were trying to do that offset image trick. So you'll see a bit later that um, we actually had to put create a whole bunch of different um, SVGs for all those angles. Um, but so here's a bunch of things that are all going on at once here. So there's a couple things to talk about here. One is we are, the shield unlock image true at the top is what makes it that you can put the label outside of the shield symbol itself. So again, we're not, we're not putting a number inside an interstate uh, highway logo, we're putting the label outside, but we're still using the shield symbolizer to do that. Um, the shield text DX 0.1 is a little something we had to do to get the alignment to work. Uh, so that moves the text just slightly off of center, and if, it, if there's no DX, then we would left align the text, but the text block itself would be still center aligned over the icon. So we had to introduce that so that the left uh, alignment would actually be the, the point where the icon is. Um, the, the three in the middle, the shield DX, the shield size, the shield text DY, uh, those are all customizable and scalable. So this is something that can work for um, any, any size symbols, any size text you want. And the one last trick I see here, and maybe Seth sees some more tricks that he'll explain in a second, is the, the chunk at the bottom. So all of the, the parts that start with shield, where we're trying to label things with the shield symbolizer. So we put the, the, the overlook icon and the big label, um, but if that doesn't work, if the area is too crowded, that we can't fit the label there, then the rule falls through. It says, I can't draw a shield, but then it finds those <laughs> rules at the bottom for the marker. And it'll say, okay, I will put the same symbol there, but treat it as a marker symbolizer instead of a shield symbolizer, so it leaves off the label. So that's how we get the effect of some things get labels if they can fit, and other things get the same icon, but no label if that's all that can fit onto the map. That way we still can, can show where most of the things are, even if we can't name them all at once. Um, did I catch all the tricks we have in there, Seth? Uh, no. The, the, the astute viewer will notice that the double wide icons will result in the, both the label and the icon being offset from the actual point. Mm -hmm. So that's what the magic negative 9 is. So it's an 18 by 18 uh, pixel icon, or 18 by 18 unit icon. Uh, and it's 36 units wide, so it needs to actually get shoved to the left by half the size of the icon in order to position it properly. So that's where the shield DX negative nine and the translate negative nine come in. Awesome. And, and finally, as I said, we, we in principle, you could rotate the, the one uh, overlook symbol to point in the correct direction, except that then using the shields, that would also rotate the text. So you would have the label of the overlook would be tilted if the, if the overlook is pointing that way. So we just created a whole bunch of different overlook icons that are all pointing different directions. Yeah. On that fall through behavior you described, is that just kind of in the rendering order? Or, do, so, or can you control, like, I want this one to be the one with no label? Um, you, yeah, you yeah, could. It's, it's, it's the rendering order. Um, so it, you put the biggest thing first. And if the biggest thing can't draw, it'll try and draw something smaller. But you could you could special you could special case it yeah. if you had one thing that you absolutely had to have labeled. You could put that rule first and say if you know the name equals such and such overlook, make sure that gets drawn before you even look at the other things. Yeah. So that's this is what took several months to create each of those SVGs. <laughs> Um, one thing we do a lot just uh, as a really quick way to get symbols onto the map um, are just to use fonts, use Unicode characters to try out different things. So 
Here, instead of having an SVG or an image for these little stars, we just grab a star out of any font we might be using. Um, and you know, Unicode, Unicode is really, really deep. You can imagine any kind of icon you could embed into a font, you could draw this way. Uh, imagine an emoji map. Someone get on that. It doesn't work, actually. Yeah, I was really disappointed. Oh. Emoji doesn't actually work. <laughs> Probably, yeah. The, the trick is that emoji is actually a multicolor font. So, yeah, HarfBuzz might actually make it work. So here's how you could do that. Um, it's basically adding, so for the place label, the text name is those things in quotes is the Unicode, the Unicode code for that star. And what, why do we need the plus undefined? I think it's a bug in either Mapnik or Cardo CSS that we've been working around. Um, if you just provide a text name that is a string, uh, Cardo CSS barfs on you, so you just have to attach it to some expression. Um, and I usually just use undefined because I'm a JavaScript, a JavaScript programmer, uh, and that just ends up evaluating to nothing, but still ends up working. So, yeah. Um, so. That's the majority of that. Uh, we thought we'd th throw out a few of the map scraps uh, we've discovered uh, and worked on in various pieces of the things. So this is something that I wanted to throw out because it's really useful. Um, CSS has this notion of display none, which is to tell an object to, or to tell an element on the page to just not show. Uh, Carbo CSS does not, but it actually does, uh, just not by that name. So uh, a couple of shortcuts. So for text, if you don't want something to show up, uh, you can set a bunch of defaults for the text symbolizer. Um, but then as long as the text name is set to just an empty string, uh, it won't do anything. So you can then uh, subsequently add a text name when you want things to start appearing, and you end up getting the defaults rather than having to redefine everything all the time. Uh, the other thing that we haven't ended up using in practice, uh, but it was kind of a neat discovery. Uh, I think I was talking to Dane about this at NASIS last year. Uh, if you use a text fill of transparent, uh, it means that the, lab that the label will get rendered, but it will be transparent. So uh, Mapnik has uh, what's called the collision cache, which is how it determines how to do label layout. So if you have two separate label layers that you want to display independently or together, um, what you can do is you can uh, take each pairing of labels and render one set transparent and then on the other you flip those around. Uh, that way there are transparent areas for the labels from the second set to slot into the first one. Um, it, it still ends up being prioritized, so the things that are more important have to be in the first layer that shows up. Um, so lines, you just set the line width to zero, and all of a sudden you have nothing. Uh, polygons, in not so lucky, uh, you can set the opacity to zero, uh, which means that they're still in there. So if you're using UTF grid, uh, I think um, they'll show up in the UTF grid. Uh, markers disappear when you tell them to have a point size of zero, or a width of zero, so they become a point that just disappears. Um, so this is something that we did um, when we were experimenting. Uh, this is Avenir, the same as the uh, super compressed text before. Uh, but the thing that's kind of interesting about it, and it's a little bit washed out, uh, is that both the ocean and the uh, forested parkish areas um, have this kind of pixely feel to them. Uh, and the way we did that is we have um, little uh, two by two, four by four, it's got to be a power of two somehow, uh, where three quarters of it is whatever you want the background color to be, uh, and then the other quarter is the color that you want to actually be in the background. And if you're really focused on what the background color is, um, you should uh, use that in place of white, but if you think you're going to end up iterating on what the fill color is, what you can do is you can create a transparent image that looks like the bottom one, uh, that includes your background color and is transparent where you want the background color to show through. And the reason that this is ordered this way is when you draw the polygon fill first and then the polygon pattern file over it, uh, it'll mask out what's underneath it and then you'll get this dot pattern. Uh, the polygon pattern alignment global is also important because if you don't do that, you end up with these kind of weird edges. You can also play around with the gamma if you want it. To, the, so gamma is not actually color gamma, it's, uh, 
more um, anti-aliasing gamma, uh, so you can make things more aliased, which makes a lot of sense if you've got hard edges. Um, so this is one of the things that Eric showed yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, uh, except to point out the triangles. Um, in this case, uh, our source data set has an orientation for each point that's in there, and it corresponds to the pixel uh, that it lives in. So if it's an even, even pixel, it's going to get zero. If it's an even, odd pixel, it gets one, and so on. So what we do then is we take the orientation to determine which part of the triangle it should draw, and it essentially rotates the uh, like a set of four pixels into a tr into a diamond, and then uh, takes those and then draws the triangle components. So uh, it, it can produce some kind of neat effects. This was just super jaggy, uh, where if you've got uh, four pieces that actually fill out a triangle, but they've got different coloration, um, it, yeah, it just produces some kind of interesting effects. Um, the other thing that Dean pointed out yesterday that was really helpful for something that we're using this much data on, uh, it was rendering fairly slowly. So he said, did you have a look at marker ignore placement, which says draw markers, allow them to overlap, and don't populate the collision cache because you don't care. You're not going to try and prevent other things from colliding with them. And that actually has helped quite a bit. So here's another, here's another one. So uh, to do this, we usually end up using just pretty low opacity shapes and then stack them on top of one another. So if you use a composite operation of light and you get a kind of world at night look. Uh, here's another one where we've got the same data. Um, the size of the triangle and the size of the square are the same here, but we're using some other uh, piece of randomness in the data uh, and using that to adjust the wobble. Um, so one Friday night while we were working, I think it was on the printer's project, may not, we just said, okay, well, what can we do that just, we, we just discovered this trick where we can add the wobble label, uh, add, add the wobble to labels. Um, so we did a lot of geometry uh, transforms and line simplification where if you just crank it outside the normal values, it, end up, it ends up just getting all sorts of tweaked. Um, used uh, composite modes all over the place. Uh, the other thing that's kind of noticeable here, there are these little paint splotches, and there's two sets of paint splotches. Uh, that's actually a dingbat font. Um, that one of them is, uh, it follows the lines on the roads, on the minor roads. Uh, and then the other one, uh, the larger oranges, orange ones, um, are actually place labels. So that it takes the name of the place and then converts each of those characters into whatever the, the symbol is that's present in the font. Um, and it's kind of noticeable here. Um, like, yeah. Uh, north of the UK, for example, there's just this really horizontal thing. So it's random stuff that we were playing around with. Uh, here's something else. This is a view of San Francisco. That's San Bruno Mountain in the middle. Um, this is what you can do if you take uh, markers of varying radiuses at very low opacity and have lots of them. Um, it's kind of nebular. Uh, and then there's this. Uh, this is Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we further subdivided the data according to a different attribute to get the different coloration and then allowed the blend modes to seep through and produce this kind of crazy thing where if you look really closely, you can figure out that that is min Midtown and that, I mean, this is effectively a population density map. Um, so Central Park is a little bit more noticeable just as a gap and then uh, the East River and the Hudson. So yeah, um, thank you very much.